Ephesians chapter 6, let's begin reading at verse 10, shall we? Let's read together. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I heard the story about a boxer that was being pummeled in the ring by his opponent. Blow after blow left him with a bloody nose, swollen eyes, a bruised torso, and an enormous amount of pain. Mercifully, the bell dinged just as he was about to collapse, and he staggered to his corner. There, his trainer, trying to encourage him, kept telling him, you're doing great, Fred. That bum is barely touching you. To which he responded, then you better keep your eye on that referee because somebody's killing me out there. <laughs> Have you ever felt like you were getting beaten up by life? You know how it is. You barely recover from one thing before another thing or two or three things pile on top of you. I have people say to me, Pastor, I don't know why all these things are happening to me. I just can't seem to catch a break. Well, before I finish this message today, I hope to shed some light on what's really going on and give you some tools to help you make it in difficult times. The text for the message comes from a letter written by the Apostle Paul from a Roman prison cell about A.D. 60 to Gentile believers in southwestern Asia Minor. It became identified with the church in the city of Ephesus as that was the most important city between Rome and Antioch. As he comes to the conclusion of his letter, the apostle turns his attention one last time to the challenge believers face while trying to live out their faith in a hostile environment. He writes here in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So right up front he says that the strength you need is not human strength. See, real strength isn't a matter of mere muscle power. It isn't determined by how much you bench press. It isn't represented by bodybuilders or even superheroes. The life of a believer in Jesus isn't a carnival cruise ship. It's a battleship. It isn't flying along in an airliner, sitting in first class, sipping on a cold drink, it's a fighter plane headed into a dogfight. It isn't zipping along in a convertible with a top down. It's a battle tank moving onto the battlefield. It isn't plinking at paper targets with a BB gun. It's loading up with high-powered high powered artillery to face a deadly enemy. Real strength is a matter of the inner man, the spirit and soul. Real strength is comprised of character, and will and determination. It's a matter of the inner man, the spirit and soul. It's faith-based and grace-given. Be strong, not in your own strength, but be strong in the Lord. There is a very real battle with a very real opponent on a very real mission to destroy your spiritual life. So you're going to need to be strong in the Lord. Right on the heels of that exhortation, the apostle talks in verse 12 about the struggle that is real. He says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, it's entirely possible that I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble with this message before I'm finished. So you just as well to fasten your seat belts and hang on because I'm probably going to upset somebody's apple cart today. And while I'm at it, I would just tell you 
Don't bother sending me any scathing emails or letters or texts of objection. I'll just tell you up front, it's not going to matter one bit to me. In this verse, the apostle identifies your true opponent. Pay attention to the very first thing he says. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I want somebody to write that down in big, bold letters and post it someplace where you will see it regularly. Other people may be used by your spiritual enemy, but they are not the enemy. You do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I'll say it again. You do not wrestle or struggle against flesh and blood. I have a person in my friend list on social media who spends a lot of time posting scathing commentary about the, quote, evil totalitarian Democrats. Now, regardless of what you think about the Democratic Party and their platform, the Democrats are not the enemy. And for those of you listening to this message who are Democrats, the Republicans aren't the enemy either. I'm part of a discussion group of ministers. And right now, there is a lot of energy being used in that discussion group to rail against the encroachment of the LGBTQ and all the other letters agenda, both in society at large and particularly in some of our religious educational institutions. Unless there be any mistake, you will never find me condoning this behavior in any shape, form, or fashion. But the gays are not the enemy. Those who march shouting Black Lives Matter are not the enemy. Those who respond with equal vitriol, Blue Lives Matter, or All Lives Matter, are not the enemy. Those who cross the borders of our country illegally are not the enemy. Terrorists are not the enemy. Muslims are not the enemy. The struggle is not against flesh and blood. And I'm, just, I'm this far into it, so I might as well continue and tell you that your spiteful spouse is not the enemy. And your overbearing boss is not the enemy. And your derelict child is not the enemy. And your godless neighbor is not the enemy. And the gang is not the enemy. And the drug dealer is not the enemy. And the molester is not the enemy. And the pimp is not the enemy. And the virus is not the enemy. And the government mandate is not the enemy. And the atheist is not the enemy. And the humanist is not the enemy. And the hedonist is not the enemy. These may they all be tools in the hand of the enemy, but they are not the enemy. Let me tell you again, you do not struggle against flesh and blood. I don't mind telling you that I don't like the recent jump in prices of everything from the fuel I put in my automobile to the food I put on my table. I don't like, in fact, I get frustrated and even somewhat angry at many of the policies that are being enacted or the mandates that are being enforced or the legislation that is trying to be passed in our country. And I don't like the liberties I have enjoyed being taken away or the militant imposition of moral standards that are contrary to my Christian faith that are being pressed upon me. But I tell you again, this is not the enemy. The struggle is not against flesh and blood. And you need, us. Ah, I'm feeling, I don't know if this is anointing or if this is just the spirit of John Morgan got on me right now. But you need to actively fight the urge to comment on every social media post and to jump into every argument and to participate in every debate and discussion. These other people may be really annoying. They may be vicious. They may be threatening and terrifying, but they are not the enemy. You do not struggle against flesh and blood. 
This is why Paul wrote to his young son in the Lord in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 through 26 and said, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged. I'd like to camp right there, but I gotta move on. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Do you hear what he's saying? He says, don't get into arguments and controversies with other people. Your goal is not to win debates about politics. Your goal is not to share insulting memes about folks who disagree with you. Your goal is to win souls for Jesus. Your struggle is not against anything you can see in the natural. Your struggle is against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Your struggle is against principalities and powers and world rulers of this present darkness. Paul writes about the struggle that is real. Then he continues in verses 13 through 17 and talks about the supplies that are required. He says in verse 13 that you're going to need some armor for this battle. So he says, take up the full armor of God. And Paul uses the Roman foot soldier as an illustration for the pieces of armor you're going to need in this battle. But he actually got the idea of the whole armor from the Old Testament. See, in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17, the prophet talks about God putting on his armor. He says, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. Now, the reason it's important for you to understand that this is where Paul gets his imagery of the, army, uh, the armor of God is because this armor Paul talks about isn't just something that God supplies to you. Rather, it is God's own armor that he himself wears. When you put on this armor, you are actually putting on the nature and the character of God. Now, I want you to think about that as I describe the various pieces of this garment. First of all, he says there is the belt of truth. See, Roman soldiers, you remember, wore tunics, which were essentially short dresses for men. And the last thing you want in battle is to have this flowing garment flapping around, catching on everything or blocking access to your weapons. So what they would do is they would tie it down with a belt. This belt also served as a place for hanging the various weapons, especially for hanging the scabbard with the sword. In addition, from this belt hung strips of leather to protect the lower body. The belt was wide enough as a girdle to protect the kidneys and other vital organs. In reality, the belt tied everything together. Now, Paul says that the belt of spiritual armor is a belt of truth. See, everything is dependent on truth. One of the reasons we have such a difficult time knowing what to do and which plan of action to take these days is because it's so hard to find out the truth. People are saying what fits their agenda, whether it's true or not, and they leave out anything that contradicts their desired outcome. Well, the wisdom writer said in Proverbs 23 and 23, buy truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom and instruction and understanding. Paul instructed the Philippians in chapter 4 verse 8 to dwell on things that are true. Truth in the Bible is not just accurate facts or information. Truth is also bringing something into the light. It is unhiding something. So this belt of truth is a protection because it's genuine. It's not hiding. It's not hypocritical. It means you aren't faking your faith. But everything is held together in your life by the truth that sets you free. You need to fill your life with that which is true, which means that your life is filled 
filled with Jesus because he said in John 14 and 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. See, Jesus doesn't just tell you the truth. He is truth. So put on truth. Keep the word of truth ever before you. Hide the truth of God's word in your heart. Meditate upon it. Saturate your mind with it. When your relationship with God is based upon faith in Jesus and the truth that he reveals and imparts, then when accusation is brought against you by the enemy or by one whom he is using, you can stand against him because why? You're just standing on truth. It doesn't matter what you say. It won't refute the truth. When you refute the enemy, you're not arrogant, you're not irrational, you're not crazy, you're just holding to that which is true. Since you've been born again by faith in Jesus for the first time in your life, you are really in your right mind. Everything in this armor is held together by the truth, which is Jesus himself. Then he says, you're to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Everybody still with me? I know I'm going real quick, but I, because I, I got a lot going on here. The, the breastplate of righteousness. This isn't your righteous acts. Rather, it is the righteousness of Jesus himself. This righteousness, he says, is a protection for the breast area. That's where your heart is. You protect your heart with the righteousness of Jesus. The wisdom writer gives this instruction in Proverbs 4.23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. I want to tell you, one of the enemy's tactics is to try to get you to doubt your salvation. He'll get you to question whether or not you're accepted by God. He'll get you to the point where you start asking, am I really a child of God? Is God really pleased with me? This attack is, call, is designed to cause you to lose heart. And the answer to this attack is the breastplate of righteousness. You put on the imputed righteousness of Jesus to protect your heart. That's what 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 is talking about when it says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that, watch this, we might become the righteousness of God in him. What that means is that God swapped your sin for his righteousness. That was good right there, Pastor. You should have gotten a bigger amen out of that. Any weapon wielded against the child of God it vaporizes as it touches the righteousness of Jesus. <clears throat> That's why Romans 8 and 1 gives this assurance. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, there's the belt of truth. There's the breastplate of righteousness. Then there are the boots of the gospel of peace. Centuries ago, the Danes decided to invade Scotland. They moved their great army in during the night to take the Scots by surprise. To be as noiseless as possible, they came barefooted. As they neared the sleeping Scots, one unfortunate Dane stepped on a bristling thistle and yelped out in pain. The Scots were alerted and the Danes were driven back. One could say they came within one foot of victory. <laughs> <clears throat> Just seeing if you're still awake and paying attention. In memorial, the thistle was adopted as the national emblem of Scotland. It's been said that the Roman soldiers' boots were the secret of Roman victory. Just imagine a fully armed soldier wearing flip-flops. Uh, no, in a fight, footing is everything. And there's only one thing that can be relied upon to provide sure footing. And that's the gospel. Try and take a stand on secular politics and you'll land flat on your face. Try and take a stand on social issues and you'll end up knocked backwards when society reacts negatively. Too many people are trying to major on things that are minor and minor on things that are major. Keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is the gospel. See, most of the anger and the angst and the offense that I see isn't about the gospel. It's about a particular way of life. It's about certain behaviors. It's about personal rights. What you've forgotten is that the Bible talks more about corporate responsibility toward others than it talks about personal rights. I wish I had time to unpack that. I'm just gonna have to leave it with you and move on. If you're going to take offense, take offense for the sake of the gospel. 
Paul declares in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And I want to tell you, it's not just any gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus, the good news about Jesus. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Man, crucified, buried, resurrected, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified, freed me forever. One day he's coming back, oh glorious day. That's the gospel. Take your stand on the gospel. There's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of the gospel of peace. And then Paul, can I just back up long enough to tell you it's a gospel of peace. It's not a gospel of beating somebody else up. Then Paul talks, I got to move on. Then Paul talks about taking up the shield of faith. Now the shield for a Roman soldier was vital. The normal battle shield was about two and a half feet wide by about four and a half feet high. It was a solid wood, a solid piece of wood covered with metal and then a final layer of leather. This was the soldier's primary defensive piece of armor. See, the only long range weapons in those days were arrows. And often the enemy would dip the tips of those arrows in tar and set them on fire before they launched them. So to combat this, the Romans would soak their shields in water before going into battle. The wood and the metal of the shield would stop the arrow from penetrating and the water in the leather would extinguish the flame before it could catch the shield on fire. Now, can I just tell you today, you have a spiritual enemy that is constantly firing flaming arrows at you. How about this? Arrows of temptation, doubt, pain, discouragement, depression, fear, hopelessness, guilt, shame, greed, addiction, stubbornness, lust, envy, bitterness, pride, ego, unforgiveness. Those are just some of the flaming arrows he launches against you. Have you experienced something like that? Maybe just in the last week? (laughs) Paul says that your defense against these flaming arrows of the enemy is a shield of faith. This faith he's talking about is an unshakable trust in who God is and his promise of care over your life. It's your faith that will extinguish these arrows. It's your faith that will protect you from these attacks. It's your faith that will sustain you. This is the faith Paul is writing about in 2 Timothy 1 and 12 when he says, For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day. This is the faith of Philippians 1 and 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. This shield of faith is a critical piece of the armor. But I wonder how many of you could testify today that sometimes your faith is weak. Anybody besides me? I'm just, okay, okay, good. I, I didn't want to feel all by myself up here. See, sometimes it can seem like there are too many arrows coming too quickly and you can't ward them all off. Some of them get through. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, I want to tell you, this is where the church becomes so critical. Now watch this. You see, the Roman army took some lessons from the warriors of ancient Sparta. When the enemy began to launch their arrows, the Roman army would get into a formation called a testudo. Testudo is Latin for tortoise. This was a very tight formation in which the shields of the soldiers, they would interlock them. They would lock shields in front, on the side, and overhead, forming a tortoise. This army didn't fight as, an, as, individual, as individual soldiers. They fought as a unit. So they protected each other. When one soldier couldn't stop the barrage of arrows coming against him, the entire unit could come together, get in this tortoise formation, and they could stand even when it seemed to be raining flaming arrows. 
Can I tell you, that's one of the reasons why the writer in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25 says, let us hold fast the confession of our faith, of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. See, this is the beauty and this is the power of the body of believers. Because when your faith is weak, if you can just get together with other believers, they will hold up their shield of faith and they will protect you so you will not fall. When your faith wavers, that's when the faith of your neighbor is strong and stable. When you want to quit, the faith of your brother and your sister helps keep you going. Even, even if you happen to fall, you won't fall away because you'll be surrounded by brothers and sisters that will support you and they'll lift you up and their faith will sustain you. Don't, don't neglect meeting together with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Your faith needs that connection. Well, there's the belt of truth. There's the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith. Then there's the helmet of salvation. The helmet obviously covers your head, which contains your brain. The brain is the command post of the body. It's the decision-making headquarters. Your mind is especially susceptible to attack from temptation, from negativity, from fear, from unbelief, and from error. According to Romans 8 and 7, the mind set on the flesh, that is the carnal mind, is hostile toward God. According to Romans 7 and 23, Satan is waging war against the law of your mind and bringing you into captivity. The primary battlefield is in the mind. And one of the greatest things that can happen to you today is for you to get saved brains. The wisdom writer taught in Proverbs 23, 7 that as a man thinks, so is he. See, if your enemy can get you thinking anxiously, if he can get you thinking negatively, if he can get you thinking fearfully, then he has you right where he wants you and you'll give up. But this is a helmet of salvation. That means God has saved you, he is saving you, and he will save you. You are in Christ. Romans 8, 38 and 39 is still true. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Maybe everything isn't going just exactly the way you want it to go. But you're saved. Maybe tragedy has struck and things just keep falling apart, but you're saved. I said you're saved. Maybe all your resources have been depleted, but you're saved. You're saved. You're in his hands, and there are not enough demons in hell that can ever pull you out of his hands. The last piece of equipment is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Now, notice this is both a defensive and an offensive weapon. The enemy, see, wants you weaponless. And if you don't know the word, you're at the mercy of the enemy. And can I just tell you, he doesn't have any mercy. Paul wrote to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. That's the importance of Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. I want to tell you, there's power in this book because it's the sword of the spirit. The power comes from the words the Spirit has infused into your Bible. God says in Isaiah 55 and 11, my word which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I said it. I want to tell you, every time you quote scripture, you unleash the power of God's Spirit in a conversation. You'll deflect the enemy's lies with the truth of God's word. You'll cut to the heart of the issue with the revelation that comes from the word of the Lord. Everything the enemy throws against you is to be evaluated evaluated against the word. Now I've got one minute to finish up this next last point and I'm not going to make it so y'all just hang with me and keep the doors closed and we'll let them in when I'm done. 
Paul talks about the struggle that is real. He talks about the supplies that are required. Finally, he talks about the stand that is radical. At the end of the day, the true purpose of the armor isn't to enable you to rush into battle and engage the enemy. That's going to mess with some of your theology, so just let that soak in for a moment. The army is not so you can run out to battle and engage the enemy. He tells the purpose in verse 11. So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. He says it again in verse 13. So that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. He says it one more time in verse 14. Stand firm, therefore. Most people, most people hear about this armor of God and, 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 you know, the spiritual struggle and warfare, and they want to be a little more active. I mean, you want to go on the offensive. Attack! Storm the battlements! Destroy the enemy! Hmm. Your mission as a believer is to stand. The mission of the church is to stand. Now, standing seems rather boring until you understand something about warfare during the time this was written. I've already described for you the, t- the testudo formation, the, the tortoise formation, you know, where the Roman soldiers would lock their shields in front and overhead. All right. This formation would make the arrows launched against them from a distance ineffective. So the enemy then would have no other choice but to try a mass attack against them with infantry which is exactly what the Romans wanted them to do. These infantry men would rush onto the battlefield and they would crash into those locked shields over and over again until the enemy grew exhausted because they're just stalwartly standing. And then when they're exhausted, the Roman cavalry would come in from a flank and run them down. Now tell me, doesn't that describe the way some of you are feeling right now? It feels like wave after wave of problem and disappointment and heartache is crashing on you. Come on, somebody. Am I preaching where you're living right now? And one of the hardest things to understand and accept is that the battle is the Lord's. The victory is His. You know, over and over again in the Bible, you read account after account after account where the Lord told his people to simply go out and stand against an overwhelming enemy force that was bent on their annihilation. When they went out and stood, the people of God never even had to unsheathe their swords because God himself defeated the enemy. They were just there to witness his victory. And this is how people of God are to approach the battle with the forces of darkness. Your job is to stand for the truth of the gospel. Your job is is to bear witness to the victory that Jesus has already won. Your job is to share the truth with others so that you can snatch people from the darkness of Satan's lies and bring them into the glorious light of God's truth through Jesus. That's the mission. Let me bring it down and say it another way. When the voices of academia are denying the existence of a supreme being, the mission of the church is to stand firm and declare that there is a God in heaven. When the skeptics and the cynics and the unbelievers ridicule the Bible as a man-made book filled with fables and riddled with error, the mission of the church is to proudly and boldly proclaim the Bible as the authoritative word of the living God. When the voices of religious accommodation are insisting that there are multiple paths to God, the mission of the church is to stand firm and declare that there is only one way, and that is through faith in Jesus, for he alone is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. When the voices of modern culture are trying to blur the distinction between male and female, and are affirming and congratulating the person born male when he decides to transition and come out and identify as a female. It isn't hate speech 
to boldly say that it is impossible for a male to become a female or for a female to become a male. The mission of the church is to affirm the biblical truth that God made distinctly male and female, distinct and separate from one another. It isn't hate speech to say you cannot change your gender. It's simple biology. In the midst of a permissive culture that indulges and celebrates every behavior that brands itself an expression of love, the mission of the church is to stand firm and to proclaim that adultery and fornication and homosexuality and every sexual union that is not part of the monogamous marriage relationship between one man and one woman, everything from hooking up to shacking up is a perversion and is unacceptable for those who are born again and desire to please God. When innocent children are being sacrificed on the altar of expediency and conveniency in a procedure we call abortion. The mission of the church is to stand firm in our rejection of the heinous practice and in our resolve to defend the helpless. In a world that is focused on material possessions and power and entertainment, the mission of the church is to stand firm against every idol that would seek to usurp the first place reserved for God alone. The mission of the church is to say, you can challenge me, you can combat me, but you cannot cancel me. The mission of the church and every believer that is part of the church is to stand firm. No, we used to sing a song in old church. Maybe we ought to resurrect it, Pastor Larry, someday. Not today, but someday maybe. We used to sing, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. Stand firm. Stand firm against fear. Stand firm against hopelessness. Stand firm against defeatism. Stand firm against injustice. Stand firm against immorality. Stand firm against idolatry, both outside and inside the ranks of believers. Stand firm against anything that is in opposition to God's word. You don't need to be combative. You don't need to be aggressive. Just stand firm. And can I just go on and tell you one more thing? You don't just need to be known for what you're against. You need to stand firm for some things. Stand firm for truth. Stand firm for righteousness. Stand firm for godliness. Stand firm for holiness. Stand firm for justice. Stand firm for generosity. Stand firm for compassion. Stand firm for love. Stand firm for hope. And I want to tell you, the good news is you don't have to stand alone. That's why there's a church. We stand together. I I had to tell you, I'm tired of seeing church people taking pot shots at one another. I'm tired of seeing church people divide over personal preferences. Your brothers and your sisters are not the enemy. Lock your shields together. Stand firm. Let the enemy crash against you. If if you'll stand together, the enemy will be repelled. And just about the time you think you can't stand anymore, that's the time to look up because that's when the heavenly army is going to show up. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. It is he who will fight and will ultimately triumph over the enemy. Here's your job. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. So put on the full armor. Get in formation with your brothers and sisters. Stand firm.
Holy Spirit, I ask you to infuse your people with staying, sticking, standing firm power. And I thank you for doing that. In the name of Jesus.